I want to talk about Yukio Mishima. He and I have had a pretty complex relationship over the last few years, but I'm going to try and come at him from all sides. <laughs> but I have a few things to clarify up front. Number one, I don't know everything about Yukio Mishima, and I have not read all of his works. Before making this video, I wanted to watch a new film that is just a debate that he did a year before he died, called The Last Debate. But I couldn't find it anywhere, and I really think it might have helped this video if I had, but I really looked. So I'm not an expert, but I am someone who finds him incredibly fascinating as an individual. I've also talked to quite a few people about him in the lead up to making this video, including a Patreon book club that I did last night, where a few of my friends and patrons really had some wonderful, insightful things to say. Not just specifically about Mishima, but about our relationship to authors in general. So first of all, I'm just going to outline how my relationship to Yukio Mishima has changed over the last few years. I got into Mishima probably about five or six years ago, when I read The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea, which is one of his most famous works. All I knew about Mishima before reading that book was the thing that most people know, that he died attempting and miserably failing a military coup, and then committed seppuku. And so that gives you a rough idea as to what kind of a person he was, to an extent. And then I read The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea, which I thought was a very theatrical and kind of silly novel. It's told from the perspective of a young boy whose mother has started dating this sailor. He's a rugged, seafaring, traditional bloke. But then he falls in love with the boy's mother, and he gives everything up. He gives up his life of sailing, he gives up his masculinity, at least from the boy's perspective, and the boy hates him for it and judges him for it. The boy is also a weird little pervert. And so this boy just feels like uh, an alt-right incel, at least using today's language. And I saw this as a pretty on-the-nose allegory for the idea that Japan has lost its masculine muster and has been castrated from Mishima's perspective. The sailor is Japan, and he wants patriarchy back, he wants power back, he wants honour and raw, rugged strength and all of these masculine things. And so I felt that the book was just a little bit childish, and I thought, okay, that was fine, I guess. Kind of interesting, but whatever. And then I learned more about him over the next you know, year or two, talked to people about him, and found that he was a fascist. He had a lot of fascistic ideas, and that led to the eventual military coup. And I just didn't want to read or promote or talk about Mishima anymore. He was a fascist. I don't like fascists. I don't want to talk about them. And then more time goes on, and I learn more about him. I learn about the fact that he was queer, he was bisexual, and he was pretty open about it. A few weeks ago, I read Bad Gays, which is a brilliant non-fiction book about different gay men and a few gay women throughout history who were really terrible people. Gangsters, fascists, kings and emperors, and they were all bad. And they were all gay. And Mishima is in that book. There is a chapter about Yukio Mishima. It talks at one point about the fact that he did a little tour of Europe when he was in Paris. I think it was Paris. He very openly and enthusiastically asked, where are all the gay bars? I want to go some gay bars. And the idea of a queer fascist obviously makes me uncomfortable, as it would make anyone uncomfortable. And my mind has changed a little bit when it comes to him because he's a far more complex creature than I used to give him credit for. I still have a lot of issues with him. And what I've just done is read three books. These are all Yukio Mishima stories that I had never read before. And I have different opinions on all three of them, and they've helped me understand his complex nature a little bit more. Again, I'm not an expert. And some things I say in this video might actually be wrong. If they are, please correct me. I still don't like Mishima's politics, at least as far as I understand them. But I am a little bit more sympathetic, because it seems like Yukio Mishima was a far-right nationalist in a reactionary sense, rather than in the sense that we often see people become fascists today and throughout history. If you look at the state of right-wing politics in the UK, for example, and I know the UK because I'm from there, the right, the Conservative Party, it's all about consolidating power, money, it's all about taking away rights and freedoms, and it's all about frightening people into voting for them, using scapegoats like benefit scroungers, immigrants, Muslims, and queer people like myself as distraction techniques, while they, behind your back, do terrible and awful things like remove rights, remove privileges, 
diminish democracy and all of the terrible things that we keep seeing them do right now. That's what you think of when you think of fascism. Diminishing people's rights, removing democracy brick by brick. Yukio Mishima wasn't like that, though. He was a nationalist because he was watching Japan in the 1950s and 60s fall apart and actually be torn apart by the West post-World War II. Japan built an empire, aligned itself with the Nazis, and did some really, really terrible, awful things for decades. The Japanese Empire was an evil, horrible thing, as all empires are. But after World War II, Japan was, in a sense, castrated. And the US planted military camps everywhere, made it international law that Japan could never have an army ever again, and put in a lot of legal restrictions, economically, militaristically, politically, to castrate Japan. And he was angry about that because he was watching the heart and soul of Japanese culture, Japanese tradition, Japanese society diminish and fall apart. Capitalism reigning supreme, enormous skyscrapers being built, salary men wearing suits and going off to work for companies that might be Western owned. And he saw the heart and soul of Japan disappearing and he wanted to return Japan to a pre-capitalistic, pre-Western influenced society. And that's a complicated thing, isn't it? That's really, really complicated because I'm an anti-capitalist and I think there's something noble in trying to remove Western influence and capitalism from your society. But also, Imperial Japan was awful. Pre-capitalism isn't really a thing and Japan was no fairy tale place before that either. But I'm not Japanese and I don't want to say too much about their society, that's not fair, and I don't know everything. I just think what he was doing, you could see it as noble, you could also see it as dangerous and fascistic. I think it's complicated. And I don't really know where to stand on it. I don't really have a solid opinion on it. I'm just expressing the fact that I no longer see him in black and white, but as a very complicated reactionary person and a queer person. Everything I say here is not set in stone, by the way. I'm going to change. We all change all the time. We all learn new things. We all get told new things and we can change. At least some of us. I'm sure a lot of people in the comments will be less kind. But I also want to talk about these books that I read because I just spent a week reading these three books. I need to talk about them. First off is Star. This was translated by Sam Bett and he did such a beautiful job. And this book is tiny. It's just a little, basically a little short story. Gorgeous cover. Star is told from the perspective of a young 23-ish year old actor who has let fame and fortune and power go to his head. And it's a book that basically explores how weird and surreal celebrity culture is and what it's like being a celebrity. And you can tell that it's very much inspired by Mishima's own life and the way that he saw himself as an artist. Mishima wasn't just a writer, he was an actor, he was a playwright, he was a model, he was a lot of things. And so he was famous in many different ways. And so you can see a lot of him in this. You can also see a love for the masculine form because Mishima wasn't just someone who admired masculinity in a sort of right-wing sense, traditionalist sense, patriarchal sense, but also because he enjoyed men, he was bisexual, and he loved the male form. And you can see some of that in here as well. His sexuality plays a part here. It doesn't really come to any specific conclusion, so much as just looking at how weird celebrity is as a concept. The actor does some horrible things, has some weird views, and encounters weird conversations with people. It's a tiny little story that just follows a few days in the life of an actor while he's making a movie. And that's it. It's just him looking at celebrity culture, probably reflecting on his own celebrity, and just thinking about how weird it all is. That's it, it's a reflective story. And I really enjoyed it for that. I thought it was lovely. I then read Thirst for Love, which is probably now my favorite Mishima story. Thirst for Love, is effectively a gothic romance. It really reminded me of the Brontes. It really felt like Wuthering Heights. And I was so pleasantly surprised by that. Our protagonist is a young woman called Etsko. Etsko was married to a man who was philandering and mean and rubbish, and then he died. And now she lives with her late husband's father in their family home in the countryside just outside of Osaka. She's basically been wrangled into forming a romantic and sexual relationship with her late husband's father, which is horrible. She feels cold, dead inside, numb, and it's a horrible situation. But she also fancies the gardener slash servant of the house. She pines after him. She watches him. She admires the way that he looks. 
And once again, because Mishima is bisexual, you can see a lot of romantic and sexual lust in this book. Mishima is admiring Etsuko's form from a leering perspective, but he's also very much admiring Saburo, the servant. And you can see a lot of gaze in this, a lot of male and female gaze. You can see the way that the men see Etsuko, the creepy old man, the way that he sees her, and also the way that she lusts after the servant. There's a lot of lust in this book, and you really feel like you're just getting Mishima's bisexual eyes on every beautiful human being in the story. Nobody is nice in this either. Etsuko is a victim in a lot of ways, a victim of a lot of different men, a victim of patriarchy and abuse of the system of marriage, romance, tradition, etc. But she's also horrible in her own way. And so again, this is very gothic. This really feels like Wuthering Heights. You've got just a selection of horrible people being horrible. And I love Wuthering Heights. I love gothic stories. I love gothic romance in particular. And this ticked so many boxes for me. It escalates and climbs and climbs to a really powerful climax at the end. And I thought it was brilliant. I didn't feel too much of his weighty politics in here. I just found that this was him expressing his love for love. There's a lot of passion and romance in here. He was an incredibly romantic person, Mishima. He loved aesthetics, he loved people, he loved beauty, and you see it all in here. In a way, it feels kind of Oscar Wilde like that. I loved this book. I thought it was gorgeous. And I'm really, really glad that I read it. I'm glad that I put aside my initial feelings about Mishima to read something this beautiful, tragic, and powerful. Then I read Beautiful Star. This is a brand new translation. I think it's only out in the UK right now. It was translated by Stephen Dodd, and I don't think you can get it in the US and other places. If you do want to read it, get it from Blackwell's. Beautiful Star, supposedly, was Mishima's favourite. He considered it his own masterpiece. I thought it was alright. I thought it was kind of silly. I thought it was also kind of mixed in terms of his political messaging. Kind of like he had confused himself. But maybe I read it wrong and I'd love to know other people's perspectives on it. It's a pseudo-sci-fi story. It uses sci-fi to tell a tale, but it's not really science fiction. You've got a family, a really wealthy family, who have the privilege of kind of sitting around and not doing too much work, who've all convinced themselves, or maybe genuinely are right in believing, that they are aliens. That every member of this family, mother, father, son, daughter, all four of them are from four different planets in our solar system. Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and Venus. And each member of the family kind of does something different with that. But the father, the patriarch's overarching belief that he's trying to instill in the rest of the family is that they all exist to create world peace. This book was written at the height of the Cold War. You've got threats of nuclear violence. And at the beginning, the father, with the help of the daughter, pens letters to the leaders of Russia and the US to try to encourage peace and an end to the Cold War. So you actually get a letter to Khrushchev and you see it being written by this family and how they think they can inspire world peace. From here, the daughter falls in love with a young boy that she is corresponding with and eventually meets up with, who convinces her that he's also from Venus. And then later in the novel, she believes that she has had an immaculate conception. She is pregnant, and she believes that it was immaculate. So there's a lot of naivety within this family, and it's very, very funny and silly. You also get a group of men, two of them are college professors, one of them is a barber, and they all believe that they're also aliens from a distant galaxy, and they believe that they have been put on Earth to end humanity, to end society. And you know that there's going to be a culmination at the end where these two parties will come together and clash in some way. Politically, this feels a little bit naive. This feels like Mishima sort of having an argument with himself over whether or not humanity is worth saving. But nothing in here in terms of the characters, their conversations with each other, their beliefs, their actions, none of it is particularly clever. Maybe this is Mishima admitting that, admitting that there is no way to save or destroy humanity that we have to just let it be. I'm not sure, I have a lot of thoughts. Every time I think about this, I come up with something different, but it just strikes me as a bit silly. Now it is kind of a satire. It's supposed to be funny. It's clearly supposed to be comedic. It's a, it's a tragic comedy, I guess, but I just don't really see the point in it. And maybe that is the point, the idea that Mishima has kind of given up on any philosophical musings and this reflects that. 
but maybe then I'm giving him too much credit. Maybe he was just genuinely quite naive and had an overinflated ego when it came to his political views and how he thought that we could fix humanity or not. I'm not really sure, but because either it doesn't have a point or he thinks it does and failed, it still felt like a bit of a waste of time. Here, you've got an artist who has created a wonderful piece of art, a fantastic gothic romantic novel. And then here you've got this nationalistic, possibly fascistic, depending on how you view it, writer who is trying to espouse his views on politics and geo-relations and doing a pretty shit job. Kind of feel like I've come to a conclusion that Mishima was a wonderful artist when he created wonderful art, and when it came to his politics he was just wildly silly and kind of naive. I appreciate Mishima as an artist, and an idealist, and a romantic. I appreciate all of that. But Beautiful Star is silly. The sailor who fell from grace with the sea is silly. These more politically intense books come across as very naive to me. And the ones that are less political, the ones that are aesthetic works of art and examinations of beauty, those ones, those ones are really worth something to me. When I say less political, by the way, I'm aware that politics is in everything. I hate the argument, oh, you made this political, this is polit No, everything's political. But when he's trying to express a very specific political point through allegory and metaphor, that's when I don't have much time for him, because he was silly. And the military coup that he ended up attempting on the day that he died was also very silly. He was laughed out of the room. He was laughed away. I do see him as a kind of tragic figure. He is naive, idealistic. I'm very grateful to my patrons for giving their opinion on these things. I'm very grateful to some DMs that I've had, comments that I've had. All of it has inspired me to check out these books, and I've really enjoyed two out of three of them. And I'm glad that I'm reading Mishima again, because he was a fascinating character. I haven't really come to any conclusion, I don't think, but I do want to know what you think. I really need some great comments and great insights here. And I'm sure some of them will be horrible. That'll be fun in its own way. This has just been me having a conversation with myself about Mishima. And there are probably things that I've missed, but I've been talking for a while. So let me know in the comments what you think about him and what you think about what I have to say. Again, my mind can change. I like change. Change is good. Subscribe for books.